and uh, welcome to Lab 5 on Diffusion and Osmosis. So what we'll be doing in this lab is sort of establishing some passive transport mechanisms and so how, somewhat how they function. Mm -hmm. Now this is a good analog to cells and cellular function. In cells and cellular function there is both passive transport and active transport, the key characteristic difference there being. That passive transport does not use energy that the molecules <laughs> diffuse across the membrane in terms of being bumped along, okay? And then they will pass through the membrane according to perhaps their size. Now, basic diffusive gradients are incredibly important for the body. Passive, transport, and active, both. Uh, the way in which our lungs diffuse oxygen, as an mm -hmm. example. Some of the, the movements of molecules through the kidneys are based off of these processes. So these would be passive mechanisms, and there are also active mechanisms. Our sodium potassium pumps and our musculature, all uh, nervous tissue all over the place. So these are very important for us. Now, demonstrating active transport, which requires energy, would be Pretty complicated. Tough, yeah. <laughs> it would be complicated. Probably more than a two-hour lab. Yes, indeed. Well, you know, for our purposes, imagine plugging a pump into the wall and using energy to move something from place to place. Much more simplistic than that is a look at passive transport mechanisms. Now, as I flip my page here to page 72, uh, there are a couple of concepts we need to get across. Uh, those being a solute and a solvent and mixing into this the concept of a solution. So, so the solute is the substance that's put into the <coughs> liquid being the solvent. Okay, So the solute might be sugar or it might be salt or in our case it could be uh, phenothaline is another one, starch. The way I like to think about this is making Kool-Aid. Exactly. All right? So you've got a, a jug of water, which is a, a, a solution, no, no, mm -hmm. my mistake, a uh, solvent. Okay, we've got a, a jug of water, which is a solution. You place into that a powdered substance, in this case uh, Kool-Aid, right. which is a solute. And that exactly. solute will diffuse throughout our sol. Mm -hmm. Vent. Jeez, have mercy. And uh, what this will demonstrate is uh, general passive transport mechanisms, good old fashioned diffusion from a high concentration to a low concentration. So it eventually completely mixes into the solvent. To make this a solution. solution. There we go. Good lord. Uh, now, there's a variety of factors that can influence passive transport mechanisms. One of those is temperature. Obviously. And we're gonna, so as we heat a fluid up, correct. it's going to move much more quickly. Things can move through and it. I know all of y'all know about that because all of you, even if you weren't, uh, didn't grow up here in Alabama, you now know how to make sweet tea. <laughs> and you all know that you have to boil the water before you can make sweet tea or it doesn't work very well. Uh, we can increase solute concentrations. So variations in solute concentrations certainly influence rates of diffusion. The size of the solute. So big molecules move slower than small molecules. It's just okay. how this works. And uh, these are good ways of looking at general passive transport mechanisms. And included in this is the concept of osmosis. Now we're going to be demonstrating osmosis today as well. So what makes osmosis different is that it's the diffusion of water. Okay, period, water, okay. Um, is defined as a diffusion of water. So don't think of it as anything else. And then the second part of the definition is that it has to diffuse across a semi-permeable membrane. The movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane in response to solute concentrations. What I, I tell my students is that water tends to chase a solute. Okay, okay we'll That's chase good. a solute and follow it from one place to the next. Uh, the kidneys being a wonderful example of this, all right, sort of pull a lot of the fluid aspect of what would become here and out and concentrate here and down. So osmosis as a concept is super important to your daily lives. So in our exercises, the first one of these today is going to be uh, activity one, temperature effects on diffusion, and what we're going to do is... We're going to um, take two beakers of water of different temperatures, one hot, one cold, and we're going to add a dye to that. We're using a red food coloring today. And then we're going to see how fast that substance diffuses through the water uh, in the beaker. So hot water versus cold water, which uh, will allow the movement of a solute more easily. Uh, the next activity, which is activity two. So in activity two, this is the fusion across a differentially permeable membrane. OK, so we're going to add some different uh, solutes to a dialysis tubing, okay, which mimics a plasma membrane, and then we're going to put some other substances in the beaker water, okay, 
and then we're going to see how diffusion happens. It might happen in one direction versus another. It might happen in both directions. We're going to have color changes to see the effect of the diffusion, to know that diffusion has happened. Now, it's been a little bit since I've read this, to be honest, but we're, what we're dealing with in one bag is phenylthaline and sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is a base, and phenylthaline is a pH indicator. Yes. So uh, in the presence of something basic, like sodium hydroxide, phenylthaline will turn a nice pinkish like color. Like a fuchsia pink. Okay. Uh, and by comparison, we've seen iodine and starch react before. So in the presence of starch, or let me rephrase, in the presence of iodine, starch turns very dark. Or right. frankly, or, or what vice color, versa. Do you remember what color it is? Remember, it's that dark purple, blue, black, purple, black kind of thing. And so the, you'll have to pay attention to what color you see and where it is in both of these. And then by comparison, uh, last but not least, we'll be doing a rate of osmosis experiment. Now, what we'll be looking at here is a variety of bags. Uh, and a variety of concentrations of solutes. And what we're going to see is where water goes depending upon what's in the bag, what's outside of the bag, a whole variety of, of information here. And the glory of this is that it can be pretty complicated, but your lab manual has wonderful charts upon which you can write down weight variations of the bags as we weigh them. And then at the end of this, once you have all of your data figured out, we're going to ask that you graph these. Okay, we're going to ask that you graph them. And what we're basically basically going to note is uh, that some of our environments will be isotonic. Mm -hmm. Isotonic being that there's the same basic amount of solute in the bag as there is on the outside. Right. Uh, some of these will be hypertonic. And the way I think about this is if you if you place a cell or in that case a bag into a hypertonic environment, uh, the water it, it leaves. Okay, the water will leave the bag and go out into the surrounding environment chasing solute. So that would be a bag placed into an environment where there is a high solute concentration in the fluid on the outside. And then last but not least, a hypotonic environment. So when you place a cell into a hypotonic, P-O, hypotonic environment, the cell will swell and get larger. Uh, the idea is that there's more solutes in the bag than outside, so water will chase in and fill the bag up and it will enlarge. All of this we can identify with weight. Okay, and the uh, substances that we're using, uh, we're using sh uh, sucrose, sugar, table sugar, and water. So your solute uh, would be your sucrose, and then the solvent will be the water. Now you have to pay attention to which ones where in terms of the bag versus the beaker. So we'll make sure we've shown that to you. And that is how this is gonna work That's out. Right. So let's go into looking at temperature variations on diffusive capacity. Activity one. All right. This is, mm -hmm. this is the cold water, and it's at 16 degrees Celsius. All right. As opposed to the hot water. Which is... Now, 74 degrees Celsius. Final temperature readings. This is the hot water. And it reads out to about, call it 68, 69 degrees Celsius. And uh, here, what we have is, call it 18, 18 okay. degrees Celsius, somewhere in the neighborhood. So, yeah, there is our final temperature. All right, Ms. Rose, so what are you holding there? Okay. All right, so I've got the dialysis tubing that we're using in this experiment, and um, we have to soak it in water to make it flexible, for one thing. And so we've been doing that for a couple of hours. 
And now we can tie knots in it. You know, my book, it mentions a string, but it's just easier really to tie a knot in it. And you can see I can kind of move it between my fingers to get it to open up so we can add a solution to it. And this dialysis tubing is rated so that molecules can diffuse across the membrane. Okay. And so how are they able to diffuse across the membrane? Well, they move from a concentration of high concentration to low concentration. So what, is. What, what I'm what I'm getting at is that that bag there will have very small holes in it. Okay. Very, very small holes. Uh, holes so small, in fact, that some molecules aren't capable of passing through, but right. others are. Right. It all has to do with their molecular weight. And so today we're using some uh, substances like sodium hydroxide that has a small molecular weight. And then we're also using starch that has a larger molecular weight. So those are the solutions that are going into the bags. And then we've got solutions that will be in the beaker, in the beaker water. And so we have iodine and phenolphthalein. And so they both have relatively small molecular weight. So according to the molecular weight, that will determine whether they can get through the holes in this dialysis tube. So who moves through is somewhat dependent upon the, the physical size of the molecule Correct. itself. Yeah. All right, well, let's, uh, let's see one of those bags being okay. filled. Pull your knots tight so it doesn't leak through the knots, okay? So you notice I twisted the dialysis tubing before I tied the knot. Okay, so what we have here is our bag with phenolphthalein, which is transparent, and then our bag with starch, and starch takes on this sort of milky appearance. <coughs> Sodium hydroxide in our beaker on this side, which will get the... Uh, and here's our phenolphthalein. <laughs> and here's our iodine. So we're going to set this up on a time lapse with the starch bag. We're going to set this up on a time lapse so you can see it happen in real time. It's going to be very fascinating. after a pretty long period of time uh, we have a very pink bag with a uh, tinge of pink to the water all right we have a quite dark bag with a virtually unchanged beaker okay so this is very telling very telling indeed okay so what's going on here remember that this is the one that had phenolphthalein in the bag and sodium hydroxide in the beaker water Okay, so now the question is, what diffused where? Okay, <laughs> that's the bottom line question. So remember that both the beaker water and the bag were clear. So now the bag has this fuchsia pink color, and, um, but we only put phenolphthalein in it. So how did it become pink? And what happens is, because uh, phenolphthalein is a pH indicator, it's a hard word to say, so you can always say pH indicator, and sodium hydroxide in it is a base, and they have to touch, and when they touch, the molecules come in contact with each other, and then you get the fuchsia pink color, okay? So, in other words, then the sodium hydroxide had to diffuse into the bag. <clears throat> now, in addition, our beaker water is pink, okay? Not quite as fuchsia, but it's still pretty good pink, and so that means that, you know, nothing leaked out, but the phenolphthalein diffused through the membrane to come in contact with the sodium hydroxide in the beaker. At a much slower rate. At a slower rate. That's the way true. I would probably would approach the subject. It, it could also be a, a volume thing, so the volume inside is very low, whereas the volume of the beaker true. is very high. True. But if I had to guess, I would say that the molecular weight of um, what's in the back, of the phenolphthalein is probably much higher, so true. it moves much slower. True. Whereas your sodium hydroxide on the outside moved in very yeah. quickly. True. And if you Look back at the video of this when we first dropped it in, it was an immediate change. Yeah. That's very indicative of a small molecule moving very quickly through the very small pores in this semi-permeable membrane. Yes. Now by comparison to that over here, we have our starch and iodine. Go ahead. All right. So remember that the starch was kind of a cloudy, milky kind of color. <clears throat> and so now we have this uh, dark blue-black color, which 
happens when iodine comes in contact with starch. Okay, so we've got the dark color in the bag. And then our beaker water is still the same color of, as the iodine in the beginning. So obviously then starch did not diffuse out. Iodine diffused in to, across the membrane, but starch did not diffuse out. So the question becomes why? Why would starch not diffuse out? And we talked about this a little bit in the beginning. Iodine is a very small molecule, but starch is this big polysaccharide complex. And so starch is too big to diffuse through the tiny, tiny holes in the membrane to <clears throat> diffuse out of the bag. Thank you so much. What we have here is our bag set up. Let's go through this real quick. So we have a bag with 0% sucrose in it, i.e. water. A bag with 10% sucrose in it, as seen here. A bag with 40% sucrose in it, as seen here. And then we have the specialty. This is not in your lab manual, this is secondary. Uh, and what this will be is a bag with no sucrose in it. This is a water bag, but it's going to be placed into a beaker, which contains a very high amount of sucrose over here. So this is water, 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 super high sucrose. And then the bags that are going in those will be water or no sucrose, 10% sucrose, 40% sucrose, and water. All right, so that's how this is going to be set up. Our initial weights are as follows. So this is going to be 11.1 .1 grams for the first water bag, and that's going into a um, beaker containing water. Well, this is, yeah, we can just wait a second. Yeah. So the next one is going to weigh 11.3 grams. Look at that consistency. Look at that consistency. Okay. The next one is 12.1 grams. And then last but not least, 11.6 grams, professionalism, professionalism. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to place these into their associated beakers, and uh, we'll come back and see you in five minutes. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to demonstrate how this weighing procedure is done. Uh, you've seen some of the time lapse. The idea is as we take these out, we dab them a very specific amount of times, uh, very consistently so that they are all dabbed the same way because we want to get as much water off of the outside of the bag as is physically possible. Then we weigh them, make sure it's teared at zero grams, uh, weigh them, and then place them immediately back in the water just as quickly as we can so that we can keep up with our times. And again, we have everything incredibly well labeled both here on the table as well as on the glassware itself. You can see on the glassware itself they are fully labeled. And uh, we have our clock here, which <laughs> is working just fine. Hang on, let's not record the password. <laughs> and uh, once that hits the appropriate amount of time, we'll go ahead and start weighing these. And we're keeping track of our weights here in our lab manual. And at the end of this, we're going to come back and show you all the weights, uh, but for the time being, we're going to do a quick demonstration of how the weighing procedure itself is done, just for, you know, common knowledge's sake, and uh, then we'll come back at the end and show you the finals. Okay. okay so, so you know that this is going to be at 15 minutes if you're following in the lab book on page 78 and 79. And then since we have four beakers, I've drawn myself in an extra table to show this special 
solution this that we have that's not in your lab. All right, here we go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my bag out. I'm going to dab it one, two, three times very specifically and weigh it at 11.5. And my lab partner here is recording weights. So it's going to go back in immediately, take it out. One, two, three. We're still at zero grams. Give it away. 12.1 grams. All right. Next one. One, two, three. It's going to be 13.9 grams. And then last but not least, one, two, three. This is going to be 11.2 grams. And that is how you very efficiently set up this procedure. Here's my amazing lab partner doing the mathematical side of things. Why I, an equally amazing lab partner, do the cleanup work because this is a balanced situation where we're all working together and efficiently towards a common goal. All right, let me set you up with what you uh, actually are looking at here. These are changes in time, okay? So five, zero minutes, this is initial uh, five minutes after five minutes of soak, 10 minutes after 10 minutes of soak. These were taken out and weighed. Our initial weight was like 11.1 for this example, 11.4 for the next one. And what we've done here is we've gone through and calculated what I call a delta G value. This is a change in weight. So the difference between these two would be this value here. In this particular case, going up by 0.3 grams, which is somewhat to be expected, even though in this particular case, uh, this is water in water. So you can gauge from that what you will. Uh, this increase in weight is somewhat to be expected uh, because what we've done is we've taken this theoretical bag of ours and we've placed it into an aquatic solution. What it's done is it's hydrated parts of the bag, so it picked up a little weight. Uh, you'll see that not much has changed from then on out. So this was a big change because we're hydrating the parts of the bag that were dry, and then this is uh, not much happening afterwards. So that's what these charts are. We have weights, and then changes in weight, and then an overall augmentation. So from start to finish, how much weight actually changed. And what you'll see is that some of these changed by a lot, and others changed by very little. So let's talk about what that means. I want to do for you here is make a couple of graphs. Now on this graph what I'm going to have is time, so it's going to be over time, and then here we're going to have a change in weight. Okay, that's what this is here, change in weight. And what we're going to see is that there can be a multitude of options. Let me see if I have multicolored chalk here. And what is going to go on? It'll work. <laughs> this will work. This will work. All right, so what we have is in some situations, the initial weight never changes, okay? That's going to be as close as I can make never changes. And in the event that the weight never changed, we would consider that? Isotonic. As an isotonic environment. So the amount of solute in the bag is the same as the amount of solute in the fluid around the bag. Ergo, uh, there's a net balance, if you will, of fluid moving in and out of the bag at any given period of time. Now, water's still moving. And in reality, you may see a slight gain, a slight loss, but basically it's insignificant. So if you have an overall change of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 grams, that's not really enough to count. Along, as I said, along the way, you might gain a tenth of a gram, lose a tenth. So it might go up and down, but overall, there's no change. Because there's always going to be net movement of fluids. Okay, this exactly. is how this works. Yeah. Now, by comparison, what if our initial value is here? And it does this, okay? If the weight goes up over time, if the weight goes up over time, uh, what, we, what has happened is there's been more solute in the bag. And so because there's more solute in the bag, the water that's in the beaker wants to chase into the bag and make it get larger. And if the bag gets larger, that means more water's in it, and that means the weight goes up. And now, of course, you can see that this is a significant change. Not just tiny little tents, but it might be 0.5 grams and higher. Okay. So that is a hypotonic, a hypotonic environment. Okay, where's the isotonic here? Isn't the hypotonic here? All right, and then last but not least, there is the option 
of having the amount of fluid in the bag go down over time. Okay, down over time. And the event that the amount of fluid goes down over time, what, that's, what that means is that there is more solute in the beaker than there was in the actual bag. All right? So the solute in the beaker kind of draws the fluid out. This is osmotic pressure. So water leaves the bag. Ergo, the weight goes down. And that... And that would be hypertonic. Would be placing that cell into a hypertonic environment. Now, you had mentioned something about IVs. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. So the value of these experiments, and um, you notice that we've concentrated on the identity of the solution, okay, the environment, what's in the beaker. And the reason being is because many of y'all are going into the health field, and you have the ability to alter a patient's body environment by IV solutions. And you have to be very careful about that. It, you know, it sounds like IVs are... You know, we use them all the time. There must be some routine method of putting them on and just we walk out of the room and we don't worry about it. But if the IV solution is incorrect, then you could, in three hours, you could put 30 pounds on that patient and just swell up their body. So we don't just put water in an IV? That's right. <laughs> we just, we got to be really careful. And so then, likewise, we might take 30 pounds off of the patient in three hours. And you might think, well, if you swell them up 30, you got to take 30 off, but you don't do it that fast. So it's really important that you understand that IVs, you have to pay attention to what's going on. You have to read the label on the IV. You have to know the patient's weight. You have to, there's a lot of things. To and it, it could be even more simplistic. You ever heard of a neti pot? Sure. Okay. It's one of these things people pour water through their nose. Yeah. I don't know the concept, but... Regardless, and I had a friend of mine that years ago tried this thing out, and he didn't read the instructions, and he just put straight tap water into it. And he said it burned his nasal epithelium. It just burned the mucosa that's inside of there. And it's very simple as to why. Because pure water, osmotically, doesn't cope well with your cells. So what it did is it started drawing water out of the cells of his mucosa and dried out his whole nasal epithelium and caused all kinds of problems. All right, so this is very important. This is not just numbers on a board, okay? Or in this case, letters on a board and some Greek. Uh, but regardless of that, it's not just, you know, information on a board. This is important. It matters and it works. It's, we, our bodies deal with this every single day. So what we want you to do, we showed you the numbers for two of the four solutions. Um, I calculated the change in weight and the overall weight, and then... Um, we didn't identify for you what type of solution it was, but based on our graph on the blackboard, you should be able to figure that out. So when you when you go through here, did you graph and these? And you've got questions right. to answer. We've got graphs, and yeah. we did four of these, so you'll have to kind of fudge and probably put two on one at some stage. But you'll have to figure out were they hypotonic, isotonic, or hypertonic. And in one of these events, one will be a little bit of one, like a, mm -hmm. for instance, perhaps we'll say a little bit hypertonic. And then another will be very much so, or alternatively, one will be a little hypotonic or very much hypotonic. So uh, we, what we have here is this effect from solute concentration. So one of these is 10% sucrose, okay? And the adjacent one is 40% sucrose. So this is going to demonstrate the effect of solute concentration as well, okay? All right, and so notice, like we did on the blackboard, time goes on the bottom, and then the change in weight goes on the y-axis. And just... You know, use your whole graph. Don't make things that small. <clears throat> Go across so you use a good portion of your graph and come up about two, at least two-thirds. Yeah, so let me just give you a, an example here. If I look at this and my weight's 12.1 to 15.1, so the lowest number is 12.1 and the highest is 15.1, perhaps I'll put like, uh, like 12 here mm -hmm. and then 15 here so I can that's really great. see a graph yeah. across here. Yeah. So I can really see it go up or really see it come down. And that's going to give me a lot better information than a tiny little portion. So this could be 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Or sure. it could skip. It could be 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, yeah. which would probably be better to be frank. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that is how this works. That's right. Okay. So I think that's got us all set, and uh, we hope you've enjoyed the lamp time today. I'm sure that I guarantee we have, and um, good luck. Have a good day.